Welcome. Today's session, we're going to be covering moisture-related building issues. Uh, with today's uh, high-quality housing stock, uh, consumers and builders are both faced with the issues of both interior moisture levels uh, related to human comfort and maybe something as basic as window condensation. And from a builder's perspective, designer's perspective, uh, we have to build homes that are going to be durable and last a long time which means we have to understand the moisture mechanisms and how moisture moves through and without a build within a building assembly, what can be done about that in both the design and construction, and as well as um, <clears throat> how to inform consumers on how to manage moisture levels in their home and how to deal with everyday homeowner concerns such as basic window condensation. We, we kind of categorize all of this information under the heading psychrometrics and of course, today's session we call this psychrometrics or dew point for dummies. Uh, a lot of conversations are, are going on related to dew point and how some folks are confident that they can design a building using a dew point calculation to actually permanently prevent building problems. Uh, I don't believe that that's quite an accurate statement. We're going to kind of work through some examples on that today, show you what we do know about buildings. So, with that set up, I'd, I'd like to get going through the slides. Um, I've been around for a while. My name is Joe Nagan. I'm with Home Building Technology Services in Kakana. I'm a private consulting firm. I also uh, work through the Focus on Energy programs here in Wisconsin. Everybody says, okay, say what? Psychro what? Psychrometrics. It's kind of an interesting word. You don't have to worry about trying to figure out how to spell it. That won't be on the test. But for our part today, psychrometrics is the science of air and its properties related to buildings and comfort. So in a basic nutshell, we need to understand this concept of psychrometrics because it is going to impact our buildings. It is going to impact our consumers on how they manage and operate their homes. So it is very important to be able to pull this together. Why is it important to understand? Obviously, from human comfort, if we look at moisture-related issues within a home related to human comfort, Homeowners want to maintain good skin comfort in the wintertime to avoid over-drying, respiratory issues related from buildings being too dry. And we also want to make sure that that building doesn't have an issue in the summer as well. Uh, we oftentimes, uh, even in our mild Wisconsin climate, uh, can be faced with wall condensation or floor condensation in a basement, even here in our mild Wisconsin weather. Now, on building durability, the issue is, for the most part, we build homes with wood materials. Even if we use alternative technologies such as SIPs or ICF, uh, some of these growing technologies, for most of the buildings, we still put wood roofs on them, uh, which still makes it an issue to understand the mechanisms related to moisture and wood. If we talk about the basic concept of what dew point is, again, I, I sometimes get caught up in a lot of mental ping pong games with folks where they want to discuss and debate and pound this into the ground as far as what dew point is. Dew point by definition is the temperature at which the relative humidity reaches 100% or saturation. And it's very difficult for the average layman to understand that. So we're going to try and put it in, in a context and perspective today using photos of buildings issues that you'd have to actually face both as a builder, architect, designer, or the homeowner. And again, the understanding the basics of psychrometrics and dew point can help you design, maintain, and operate buildings in a manner that promotes long-term durability. Uh, we all pretty much agree that it doesn't do any good to build some high-performance homes that only deal with energy costs and then have these buildings self-compost in about 10 or 15 years. That's not really in anybody's best interest especially with the uh, promotion of green built programs and, and that type of activity where we are trying to look at the long-term impact from many uh, alternative methods. Um, the same understanding can be used to help owners deal with ventilation operation along with window condensation. Um, oftentimes you won't get too many consumers or homeowners talking about dew point and, and uh, psychrometrics, but if you understand it, you'll be in a position, if you're the builder who gets called out on a job where you told the homeowner you were using the best in window technology, the best in building performance uh, to build their new home, but now they just simply don't understand why their new, very expensive windows have condensation and sometimes frost and a little bit of ice. So this whole concept we're going to try and present today uh, in 
pretty easy to understand terminology using some uh, very explicit photos here to show you just what's going on. One thing we always have to remember is that when we talk about moisture movement, primarily we're talking about water vapor moisture, the water vapor that would be in the air, for instance, on a day like today. Moisture always moves from more to less and from warm to cold, and we can have both items driving this moisture movement. It could be very warm and moist in a warm building in the wintertime with very dry outside air. It's obviously much warmer in the home during the winter than it is outside. So we've got two mechanisms trying to force this water vapor into the building assembly, through the building assembly, and to the outside. Moisture movement obviously could be controlled by, number one, well, we could just simply reduce the amount of moisture in the house air through dehumidification, air exchange, ventilation in the wintertime. In the summertime, even in our climate, uh, when it gets pretty humid here, we still can't air exchange and dry down the interior moisture unless the outside moisture content is less. But we can manipulate it from an actual moisture content. We can reduce the temperature differential on the building shell, uh, which in the wintertime is probably not going to work very good to tell folks to drop the thermostat to 50 just to protect the building from moisture problems. Or we could install a retarder and or a barrier. Oftentimes, uh, the building community uh, talks about vapor barriers when, in fact, we're actually really installing vapor retarders in our current building practice. The major item that, that we're trying to bring awareness about in today's uh, class and even in all our workshops that we do is the major item that folks, especially builders, have to understand in building new high-performance homes. We've known this information for over 20 years now. It's in some of the books I first bought in 1989 or 79 and 80. Uh, it just hasn't been promoted enough, and now we're able to really drive this issue home. So if we look at how this moisture in the actual air in a home moves through a building, and in our Wisconsin or any type of cold climate where we're primarily a, a heating-dominated environment, we're usually concerned about this warm water vapor working its way to the outside getting into building assemblies, whether it's a wall assembly or an attic, and possibly condensing and causing some durability issues. For a lot of folks, we're still relying on this concept of vapor diffusion, where we count on our vapor retarder material to be our primary line of defense to prevent this moist air from getting in or through a building assembly. And it's really the old school line of thought. <clears throat> we know now today through many tests done both by the Canadian government and the Minnesota uh, research wing at the university, everyone pretty much agrees in our building science community that vapor diffusion now plays a very small part in the transport of moisture. And if we want to keep that wood durable, we obviously have to prevent the moist air from getting to that cold wood surface. So here what they did, and what I have on the slide, <clears throat> is a test condition just to show the impact, and the next slide will show actual air leakage, but we believe that this is massively important. That's why we want to show these slides. What we have here is a 4 by 8 <coughs> sheet of drywall, gypsum board, whatever you want to call it. We have no paint on this, no vapor retarder material of any kind. So this is just right out of the store, and this unpaced drywall will have a perm rating of about 90 and obviously our vapor retarder requirements to classify a product as a vapor retarder would have to have a perm rating of 1.0 or less. So this untreated, unpainted drywall has a perm rating of 90, which means water vapor in vapor form could diffuse through that solid sheet very, very fast. Nothing to retard its movement at all. So what we have set up here is that over a a whole heating season where the interior conditions are 70 degrees Fahrenheit and 40% relative humidity, not uncommon in a cold climate. Over the entire heating season, by diffusion in gas form, this water vapor with nothing impeding its flow through that much surface area only transported about a third of a quart of water. Now, that's still a third of a quart. We don't want to minimize that. But a lot of folks are still hanging their hat on protecting buildings using vapor retarder technology or techniques only. It is not the major contributor to moisture transport. As you can see here, it's one-third of a quart. If we now take the same sheet of drywall 
unpainted, untreated, and simply add a one-inch square hole, just a one-inch square hole, look at now under the same conditions, the same environment, how much water vapor is now transported through that same surface area by a one-inch hole. I hope you saw that because this is what we're trying to drive home. That's why we really hammer on folks about building airtight building enclosures and then ventilating appropriately. We had a third of a quart on the previous slide by vapor diffusion. So even if you had 6 mil polyethylene or some real advanced uh, vapor retarder material, it is only going to be going after that one third of a quart. We have 30 quarts here that are bypassing your vapor retarder material by any place you have anything equivalent to a one inch square hole. That's where I'm hanging my hat. This is the item that builders, designers, architects have to understand. And people often say, well, <clears throat> wait a minute, Joe, when I get done plastering this building, I, I don't have it full of one inch holes. Well, indirectly you do. If, if you took a standard outlet on an exterior wall, by the time they wrote the drywall, as we currently do, around a standard 18 cubic inch electrical box, it's usually anywhere from an eighth inch gap to sometimes a quarter inch gap. If you physically measure that, you'll have at least one inch of square hole on every outlet, every switch on an exterior wall. So if you multiply this times several holes throughout the outside building shell, or even in the attic at the ceiling of the home, if you have a lot of can lights, electrical outlets on the ceiling for light fixtures other than can lights, uh, ceiling fans, whatever it is, bathroom fan housings that are unsealed. This is the issue. No matter how much vapor retarder material you have going after the vapor transport, the air leakage transport is going to go right around your vapor retarder material and soak up whatever's on the other side. So this is what we need to make sure everybody's aware of. And it's not magic. This is just nature at work. So if we take a look at just the natural environment that we may see every day in terms of how the moisture in ambient air works both with us and around us, if we take a look at an early morning in the fall, such as this morning, uh, yesterday afternoon it was relatively warm. There was a reasonable amount of moisture in the outside air, but it wasn't really humid. It was just a nice, comfortable fall afternoon. When the sun went down that evening, it removed all the energy from the surface on the earth, all the tops of the grass blades, the homes, the vinyl siding, the roof sheeting, the whole she shebang. Anyway, um, what happens then when the sun goes down, the energy source goes away, but the moisture stays in the air. The moisture content does not change. So now that air starts to get cooled down. The moisture gets closer and closer and higher and higher in relative humidity to where it looks like this in the morning. <clears throat> That's just the afternoon moisture from the previous day down near the cool surface of the ground that has been cooled off in the evening when the sun went away. It's the same amount of moisture, but it's very high now in relative humidity, almost to the point it's going to start to rain. But as this cloud of vapor goes away, you'll see the blades of grass all wet. This is just natural. So we could have moisture in the air in vapor form having no problem whatsoever but the minute we cool that air or push that air against a cool enough surface, we could have condensation. Here's after that cloud of vapor went away in the morning. Now we have simply wet blades of grass. This is not an actual moisture problem. This is the result of cooling the blades of grass, which happened the day before when the sun went down. The same amount of moisture is in the air. We simply cooled it down. This is no different than taking a can of pop from the store that's nice and warm, setting it here on our coffee table to watch a football game. As long as that can is warm at room temperature, it will never sweat. There will never be any condensation on the surface. If I take the same amount of water vapor and leave it in the house air, but now remove this can and put it in the refrigerator for about an hour, remove heat from the can, and now simply bring the same can back in the same house environment, exactly the same. The same amount of water vapor is still here. You have to ask yourself, why does the can now want to condense out that warm, moist house air? Is this a moisture problem? 
or a temperature problem, what you're seeing here is exactly nature at work. It's simply the process that we have a certain amount of moisture in the air in vapor form. We just expose that water vapor to a cool enough surface similar to the blades of grass. The sun removed the heat when it went away at night. I don't see any condensation on my table here. I don't see any condensation on my laptop. This is not a moisture problem. This is a temperature induced problem. And this we also must understand in how to build homes that are going to be built with wood materials that do not like to be wet for long periods of time. Here's the same situation outside. <clears throat> uh, this is my garage at home where I got up one morning. It was the fog outside on the top of the grass. Simply looked at the building and the building was sweating on the outside. This is in the middle of the fall. It's 60 degrees in the morning. Where did all this water vapor come from? It was there in the afternoon air the day before. Sun went down, took all the heat away from my building, and it's air conditioned inside, <clears throat> so the moisture in the air simply now is touching a surface that is cooler than it was the day before, and it happens to be cool enough to make it sweat or it reached 100% relative humidity, or that water vapor now reached its dew point temperature when it hit the cool surface. You can even see my exterior window. The outside of the window glass has now got condensation on it, and in the wintertime, we see the reverse, right? We see the condensation on the inside. So you have to be able to understand that this is the way it's going to work, whether we like it or not. Understanding this is the key to providing durable, permanent, long-term uh, buildings. Now, if we, if we look at a couple of examples of, of dew point situations, we'll now look at interior window condensation. We'll look at wall cavity sheeting condensation and frost. And we'll also look at attic sheeting, condensation, and frost. We'll look at and review each situation a little bit and discuss the causes and ways to reduce or eliminate these problems. For a builder, this is just not a good situation. You promoted to the homeowner that you're using the best in products, the latest in window technology, low E films, gas, in, uh, gas uh, fillers between the panes of glass, all these thermally broken spacers. The homeowners all fired up. They get in their new home. First season out in the wintertime or the heating season, they got window condensation. Boom. They pick up the phone. They call you. They say, well, wait a minute. Now, what's the deal here? You built me this nice high-performance home. All these windows, I got a lot of money invested. Why do I have condensation on that glass? What do you tell them? Understanding a little bit <clears throat> of this concept we're promoting today or talking about, will help you address this. Now, when I look at this, um, I'm asking the homeowner uh, when they're telling me now that they believe that I use an inferior product and maybe I get a golf game out of the uh, supplier of the windows because I use their brand. But look what's really happening here. Where do we see the actual condensation? The condensation is only on the bottom of the glass. It's not up the sides. It's not in the middle. It's not on the top. 99% of the time, the condensation will be on the bottom of the window only. Yet the homeowner is beating you up big time that you use an inferior brand of windows. My home I came from before with junk windows. I didn't have problems. What do you tell them? Well, what we have to understand is everything we're going to talk about here. Now, let's take a look at it specifically. When you look at that, the window is telling you exactly what's wrong here. It's telling you exactly what the deal is. Where's the condensation? It's only on the bottom portion of the glass. I don't see any condensation on the window trim, and I don't see any condensation on the frame. I don't see any condensation higher than maybe one inch on the bottom. So the window is already telling you what's going on here. This is not just a moisture issue. This is a temperature-related issue, similar to the example I used before with the can. What homeowners don't recognize and certainly understand is that even though the home may be well controlled in terms of moisture, say it's 70 degrees Fahrenheit and it's 35% relative humidity, that's not a, a lot of water vapor in the home in the wintertime, in the heating season. However, even that air at 70 degrees and 35% relative humidity has a dew point temperature, right? It'll have a point at which I touch it to a cool surface. It can and will condense out. So when we see this for the homeowner, 
we have to be able to explain this. This is not a glass failure problem. This is not an inferior product. It is a temperature-induced condensation situation. And they often right away then reply, well, why is this happening? Well, look what else is in the picture. The mini blind, right? You very seldom see a home anymore with actual real curtains over the face of the frame, the trim, the whole works. Everybody does window treatments inset in the rough opening. Well, the homeowner buys window treatments for privacy. And we all agree with that concept. But we have to always keep in mind that the only thing keeping all of the surfaces warm inside of any building is the ambient air circulating within that building, touching those surfaces, the tabletops, the drywall, everything in the building. The energy that's keeping them warmer than the outside is the energy in the inside air. What they don't realize is that, number one, air circulates in a sort of a round pattern from top to bottom within a home, especially with forced air. And unless we can get enough ambient energy to continually replace the lost energy on all of the surface of that window, wherever it doesn't get enough replacement energy, it's going to drop in temperature. And now we're going to have a cooler surface, and now that cooler surface may be close enough to the dew point of that interior air. So every time I'm out looking at a window just like this, it's telling me exactly what's wrong. That lower one inch of this particular window is simply colder than all the rest of the components you see in this picture, and it's simply condensing out the moisture. This is not a moisture problem by itself. Now, what happens also is that even if the heating contractor puts a forced air register right under the window, it helps to some degree, but you've got to look at it. We've got a six-inch shelf that the window is now set out on. And a lot of the older homes, right, with two-by-four construction, the window was only three-and-a-half inches out on the shelf. Now we're putting them five-and-a-half inches out on the shelf, even with the same inside temperature and outside temperature as you had before, you are not going to get reliably a movement of air in that window. It has to get in the window opening, circulate on the glass, and then get back out of that window opening. So the first time the homeowner drops the window shades that night for privacy, they just removed all the air movement from the window. It no longer has access to replacement energy. The temperature has to go down. It will go down. And the reason it goes down lower on the bottom is that as that energy hits the window, even with the shade all the way up, the energy, the air movement has to come down and get back out of that rough opening. It cannot circulate and stay in contact with the window and then make a square corner and drop back out to the floor. That's simply not going to happen. That's why you'll see lots of condensation on thicker walls, mainly on the bottom of the window, You'll see them on window wells or window seats where we have them bumped out because unless you can get adequate replacement energy to every square inch of that glass, there will be parts of that window that are going to be cooler because of lack of energy, not a moisture problem, but now that cooler surface may in fact now be just cool enough to get the fog or actually turn to water droplets like we have here. Let's take a little closer look. The condensation is only on about one inch of the bottom of the window. So the, uh, the homeowner has no real argument that this is a defective window. If the window was, in fact, defective, you would have the condensation completely on the entire surface. So that's not an issue, but we have to reassure them and help them work through these items. Again, I mentioned that the extension jam itself with 2x6 framing automatically shoves that window out farther. So if we look at it, in terms of window technology even, most windows only have an insulation value of three. They're always going to be the coolest surface in the building. We have casement windows that are the farthest out in the jam. Double hungs would be a little bit closer on the bottom, right? That's why if I go to a home that has casement windows, double hung or single hung, and a patio door, with all the same temperatures, same moisture content, everything all being identical, the casement windows will usually have more condensation the double hung or single hung being closer towards the source of energy 
will have a little bit less condensation, and in most cases, the patio door will not have any condensation. So you use that to work with your homeowners to help them understand that this is not a defect. This is a fact of differences in surface temperatures because no matter how high we actually have the relative humidity in the air, it doesn't have a problem in the air. It has a problem when it touches the surface, and this is exactly what our windows are telling us. The window blinds, again, they have to understand that their need for privacy has to be balanced with their need for good comfort in terms of air temperature, moisture content. So they have to also be reminded when they go to bed at night, not only do they want the privacy, but they have to be careful on setback thermostats. Because when they turn the thermostat back at night to save some energy, which we're all for, that reduction in air temperature automatically reduces all of the surface temperatures in the entire building because it's the air and its energy that is controlling the surface temperature in the buildings. So now they really make the glass cold. The walls with the high level of insulation we're using are probably never going to have a condensation problem, but with windows only having an R value of roughly three, they're already hurting. They're out on a shelf, so if they turn the thermostat back at night, they're really aggravating it, and also at night, we wind up with everyone coming home. Everybody's there. There's more people perspiring, just uh, evaporation of moisture off your skin. We're taking baths, shower, showers, taking and hanging our shower to bath towels up, all that water evaporating all night long. Now we're loading the building with water, cooling the surfaces. It's a perfect recipe for condensation, and they have to be aware that no matter how good the glass is, how well built the home is, they are going to have condensation to some degree in a cool climate such as Wisconsin. Being able to manage it is the real key here. Again, we cannot get air to circulate in a square corner no matter who you are. It just is not going to work unless you've got a fan right by the window. That's why from a design perspective, when we design bathrooms with windows on the exterior wall and design a real small window, it's very difficult for the house air to get all the way in that window, rub enough of the glass, and then get back out. We see a lot of condensation on transom windows up on top of doors, front entries, where we've got a narrow transom window. The, the window of opportunity, if you will, is so small for the house air to get in there that there's very little energy ever gets in, so you'll have condensation on, on smaller windows. Homeowners are usually very unhappy with window condensation. Um, this lady I went out with the builder here to take a look at the issue they had. They've been fighting, literally, uh, without the gloves, however, about the window condensation on this very nice, well-built home that this gentleman built for this homeowner. She happens to also be a boxer, so I had him, you know, play with me here a little bit, if you will, while we figured out their situation. But just take a look. I took the picture at night, but you can see behind the builder is a big front bay window on this new home. It's only two years old. Very good glass, latest in technology. But look at this. If, if anything I said made sense up to this point, look what we have. She's got a big table permanently sitting in front of the window so she can put uh, antique items on there. And she really does have the old-style window curtains, right? They're actually hanging on a curtain rod. So the window, how is this window ever going to get enough replacement energy to offset the low thermal value of that glass. The glass has got an R value of 3. No matter what the temperature is, it's hemorrhaging for energy anyway. It's always very, very cool. Now just the presence of the table here automatically interrupts the flow of air to any surface over there, but she's got a window. Even that sheer curtain that they have hanging here, even if it's not closed, but in the condition it is right now, it is absolutely interfering with the free movement of house air to ever get to that glass. So what we did was we suggested that she simply move the table for one night, do not change anything else at all, not the setback thermostat, nothing. And immediately her condensation problem went away. But she was absolutely convinced that this was a moisture problem and a problem related to poor quality windows that uh, the builder happened to use. Now the answer to some builders, and rather than going out and working with the homeowner, is they'll just light them up and then put them in their little urn here of ashes of problem customers. Now, I don't think that's probably going to be good for future referrals, but you have to be able to deal with consumers. Remember, they are our best sales force. 
And if you look at it, I mean, in, in our cold climate here in Wisconsin, I mean, I was driving down the highway uh, on a way to a job site, and, and I'm looking up at my overhead thermometer here, and it's 14 below zero. I mean, how could you possibly not have some surfaces in a building, especially windows, no matter how dry you had the building, without having some condensation? Outside temperatures, for the most part, are beyond our control. And as I mentioned earlier, we won't have a surface cool enough to have a problem unless you remove the heat, whether it's that, that can of pop out of the pantry that you now put in the refrigerator and remove the heat mechanically, or whether we insulate buildings, which by default automatically does the same thing because the insulation now retards the energy from ever getting to the outside skin of the building, which is the same as putting it in the refrigerator. We're just removing heat by preventing it from getting there. Now, just to drive home a little bit more on this glass surface temperature, uh, oftentimes we'll go out and do monitoring. And just to show the dramatic impact of temperature and airflow, on the windows I was monitoring here with some temperature sensors, in the first two inches of this window, on all three sides of this home that had glass to the outside, within that first two inches of the bottom of the window, we saw as much as a 12 degree Fahrenheit temperature difference between that and the rest of the window. When you have that much temperature difference on a surface already quite cool because of its lower thermal value, you are definitely going to have a situation set up where the condensation will occur within that 12 degree zone. And that's the issue. The window is not a defect. It's the lack of energy, replacement energy, to keep that surface as warm as the rest of the window, which is not experiencing a condensation issue. What I like to use if I'm going out to help uh, either figure it out on my own as a, as a designer, architect, or builder, I'll use a uh, laser thermometer that I can use with the trigger. I'll use my psychrometric wheel, which is much easier to use than a psychrometric chart. And you just often ask the homeowner for a temperature gauge and relative humidity gauge if they have that, but I usually like to bring my own along. And now you can actually go out and, and work with a consumer to help them understand the issues with their window condensation and frost. Another item that I, that I might sure want to point out here, again, it's all about energy. So even in homes where people have uh, casement windows with interior screens, which is very typical with casements, even if they leave the screens on in the wintertime, the screen is enough resistance to the free movement of air throughout the home that the air movement will never get past that screen. But the water vapor will blow right through that screen, similar to what it does through a mini blind or a window quilt. But the energy to keep the glass warm enough will never get behind that screen. So if you're out working with someone, ask them just to try something as simple as taking one or two screens off at night. Don't change anything else. And they will see a substantial improvement in the amount of window condensation, that meaning there will be less in the morning. They need to understand this. Uh, also, for consumers, I recommend to builders and designers that at the onset, if you're building in a cold climate such as we have here, present these items and these issues to consumers right off the bat to manage their expectations. If you only concentrate on how good this building is going to work from an energy perspective and forget to mention the lower thermal value, if you will, of windows and doors, and not remind them of the importance to use their tested ventilation that I'm hoping you're providing to manage the actual moisture content, bring this up at the design stage to set the expectations so that they understand no matter how well energy efficient the building is, they're still going to be susceptible to some levels of window condensation. And at least then at that point, they may ask you what they can do. Well, you can remind them of the ventilation equipment that you're putting in so they have the ability to remove excess moisture so it's not an overwhelming amount of moisture to deal with. But we get, at that time, we can talk about window treatments. People do not know the impact of window treatments. So the picture I'm showing here, obviously from the outside of this home, is my preferred method of talking to homeowners or my preferred product when I recommend uh, issues with consumers at the design stage is that you're going to definitely want the privacy. There's no doubt about that. At night, we all want our privacy in our rooms. So if you have to use a window treatment, and they cut them, right, just so you can barely get a piece of paper on each side, they got them jammed in there, 
recommend they look into the kind that you not only can raise up from the bottom, but the window treatments that you can also drop from the top down. Because remember, the air in the, in the building is working from the top down. Our forced air heating system pushes up a column of air. The intent is to move or set in motion all the air around the occupants. So it moves around the outer perimeter from the top down. So if we can drop the window treatment on top, just a couple inches, unless someone's eight feet tall, they should still get their privacy. It'll allow that energy to now get behind the window treatment, stay in contact with the window, and if this window treatment is up maybe an inch or two on the bottom, we can pin that air movement along the glass for a longer amount of time and then let it out on the bottom where we want it to come out. But with the conventional mini blinds that we nail tight to the top of the rough opening and only raise them on the bottom, the pop bottle's upside down at that point. The air has got to get in from the top. So using the kind that we can drop from the top, raise from the bottom, we can kind of manipulate the air movement in the building to get it against the glass, hold it there longer, so even if it's there longer, the energy deposited in the middle of the window will dissipate to the edges and help the edge surface temperature that we're struggling with. So there are things you can do, and I strongly recommend that because at least then we've done the best we can for the homeowner, and it gives them the tools to manage conditions later on. Now, when we talk about, uh, i got a wheel demonstration. You, you can go to several sources and buy um, this psychrometric wheel. It's certainly a lot easier than using a psychrometric chart, but I'll just walk through an example. If the homeowner tells me that they got a lot of window condensation, I go over there and I'm physically looking at it, and they tell me that they run the thermostat at 70 degrees and 35% relative humidity during the winter time for the most part, that's not an unusual setting, 70 and 35. I can use a dew point calculator or a psychrometric chart to tell me what the dew point temperature of that air is, at what temperature would that moisture, if it came in contact with a surface, start to condense into liquid? And the little calculator I have here says that the dew point temperature for air at 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 35% relative humidity, is 40 degrees, which means if I touch that air to any surface that's 30, 40 degrees, it's going to sweat. Well, that obviously is the window in this home. Again, it could be my can of pop or my favorite hydraulic sandwich. doesn't matter. If I got a cool enough surface with that kind of moisture, I may have an issue. So what I like to do is when I'm helping homeowners understand this concept, I'll use my digital laser thermometer. I can go to the home, look at their window, shoot the actual temperature of the frame. Now I know the temperature of that frame. I can look at my dew point calculator and say, wow, well, the, the dew point of this air is 40 degrees Fahrenheit. The window frame at zero here is 34 degrees. We're below the dew point temperature. We have to do something. The frame is what it is. It's only as warm as it's going to be thermally. So I kind of use that to help them manipulate and understand what's going on. Um, then they, right away they say, well, what should I be carrying for relative humidity in the home? Uh, that one's very difficult. Again, whenever we talk and, uh, to people about relative humidity, we're talking primarily about the moisture content in the air we are very unlikely to have a, a problem in midair. You will not have water vapor start dropping out in liquid form here. It always has to come in contact with a surface. So the best we can do is tell homeowners to keep an eye on things, be careful on uh, setting back the thermostat too far at the wrong time of the day, at night, when we're loading the house full of people. The sun goes away, takes all the energy away from the outside of the glass. And then they'll have to either remove a little bit of moisture through ventilation, or get more energy to the glass. Now, we definitely don't want them turning the thermostat up to 90 degrees to warm the glass. That's not a good idea. But again, they have to understand that this is not a product failure. It's just the way things work. They need to be helped through this situation so they better understand the home. Now, in one perspective, it's, good, uh, it's a good thing that we only have windows, uh, for the most part, at an R value of 3. Because if we had R19, say, for instance, window at the thermal value, they'd be able to load the house so full of moisture without having any window condensation, we'd probably be blowing our buildings apart in the wall cavities and attics. So the, the windows, we kind of look at them as the canary in, in the, uh, the mine in the home, that if we can get a homeowner 
to manage window condensation. So that, that it's really under control with very little window condensation. That's a good indication that the moisture is very well in control in that home, and we're probably unlikely to have real aggravated situations within the building assembly. So that's a good thing. I can also, you know, use that to tell them, for instance, at any given time, if I'm again measuring the, thermo the, the temperature of the frame, and say it happens to be 30 degrees, I could now go to my psychrometric chart or the dew point calculator such as I have here, actually set my known temperature at 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Now I could ask them, okay, we have a surface right now at this moment in time that's 30 degrees Fahrenheit. It's exposed to the ambient house moisture. What do you carry for temperature in the winter? And again, they'll tell me, well, okay, 70 degrees. So I can go to my psychrometric chart now, and at 70 degrees Fahrenheit, I could see that the dew point or the relative humidity would have to be 23% to have a dew point of 30 degrees that I just physically measured. So you can use a psychrometric chart or calculator in reverse. So I would tell them at that particular time, for a surface 30 degrees in that home, such as the window frame, they could not be carrying anywhere near 23% relative humidity at 70 degrees Fahrenheit because at that combination they are going to have liquid. So it kind of helps them manage the, the concept a little better that as the surfaces get cooler on the surface, the moisture in the overall house has to be brought down because no matter how well it is under control from a numerical perspective, it's only relevant to the surfaces of which it's exposed. So you want to work through a couple of those exercises uh, to figure that concept out yourself. Now, if we look at a, you know, a failure example on wall sheeting, uh, I was asked to go look at a building that had excessive wall sheeting with buckling. And, of course, the builder said, well, geez, I did the best I could with vapor retarders and all of that stuff. Well, we've got to take a look at it. But let's see if we can put this in perspective from a building failure analysis. When we got looking at the building itself, uh, up in the second floor or the story and a half on this home, uh, it had some knee walls with a little bit of exterior framing behind there. When we pulled the insulation down and looked at the OSB sheeting, such as you see in the slide here, it, there's no question there's some moisture activity going on. You can see the staining. You can see the little surface uh, uh, discolorization from mildew, whatever you want to call that. Even the insulation was froze by that moisture right to the OSB sheeting. Now, the home really didn't have a moisture problem. It was about 68, 69 degrees that day, maybe 30% relative humidity. But again, that relative humidity in the house air is not the problem. The, the challenge and the question is, will this moisture get or come in contact with a surface cool enough to condense it out? That's the challenge we have here in new, well-built homes. The more we insulate, if the insulation actually works, and we put insulation in front of that wall sheeting, that wall sheeting is pretty much going to be at outside air temperature, which we showed in the slide earlier that as far as I got, uh, I have no control over the outside air temperature. So if it's zero outside, and I've got 70 degrees inside, and i got that wall well insulated thermally, there's a very good chance that that wall sheeting is going to be pretty close to zero. How dry would you have to get the inside air to not have a condensation problem on a temperature at zero. So anyway, let's take a little look a little closer. The OSB sheeting was buckled. <clears throat> when we have moisture plus a cold surface, we could get surface wetting. Where there's drying, or where is the drying supposed to come from? That's the question we always ask the building community. When you get a surface wet, like the sheeting we just showed you, okay, it's wet, there's no doubt about it, but Where's the follow-up drying? This is the question that nobody has an answer for. I could put my shirt in a bucket of water and get it wet in 15 seconds. But to dry it, I have to have a lot of energy and airflow to now remove that, get the water back in vapor form, and take it out with air movement. So if I get the OSB sheeting wet in a wall assembly or an attic assembly, uh, is the weatherman that good of a friend of yours that he's going to be able to warm that moisture up just enough, re-evaporate it without turning to liquid, get it back in vapor form, and then move it out of there? That's very unlikely. So the key to this exercise is that no matter where you build in a cold climate, the only reliable way to protect buildings from moisture damage 
the easiest, most straightforward item that we have that we control as the building community is building those buildings airtight on the inside surface where it stays nice and warm on the surfaces with the exception of the windows because we have no control on the outside. So here you can see I took my laser thermometer on the day we were there and shot the sheeting temperature. And the sheeting temperature, as you can clearly see, was 35 degrees Fahrenheit. So using my wheel, I'm going to set that dew point temperature on the known surface at 35. The interior temperature was 70 degrees Fahrenheit and 35% relative humidity. And as we went through that exercise before, when the air is 70 and 35, I have, to, I have a dew point temperature of 40. So if I let this interior air of 70 degrees, 35% relative humidity, get past the drywall, past my vapor retarder, through the insulation, and slam it into this wall sheeting at 35 degrees Fahrenheit, I'm way below the dew point temperature. I'm pretty much toast. I'm going to have wet wood. Now, again, the question is, how long will that wood stay wet? Can you dry it? Well, sure, you'll dry that on the south side of the building with no obstruction by trees. You might dry it a little bit on the west side of the building when the sun, even in wintertime, gets around there. But you can't count on that. The only way that we can really look at this from a, a permanent, reliable way of doing this on an ongoing basis, build the homes tight enough by air sealing to keep the free flow movement of that moist, warm air from ever getting to the cool surfaces that we have no control over their surface temperature, with the exception, right, of putting all the thermal insulation on the outside of the building, and that's very unlikely to happen. Now, if I look at the amount of time in a calendar year when I'm below the dew point temperature of air at 70 degrees Fahrenheit and 35% relative humidity, look how many hours that sheeting uh, surface will stay there. So if I have 70 degree air, at 35% relative humidity, the dew point's right around 40 or 41 degrees. In our climate for Green Bay, Wisconsin, there are 4,117 hours per year where the outside air temperature is below that dew point. That's a ton of time. So if you only get something wet for a little bit and it dries right away, it doesn't stay there long enough giving the mold spores and, and things to get a, a chance to get going. But in this condition, we'd have 4,100 hours where that sheeting would be below 40 degrees Fahrenheit, even in our sort of mild, cool climate here. So, again, when I look at all of those variables that I have zero control over, the only variable I know we have control over is making that building airtight. We can't control the outside temperature, and we certainly can't control what homeowners do. And in the upcoming years, uh, even this winter with the heating bills expected to continue to rise, what are people left to do? Turn the thermostat down. Turning the thermostat down changes everything. The windows get cooler. There's less energy available to get through the wall assembly, even past the insulation. So it's going to be very important that we make these buildings airtight and durable. Now, here's another common occurrence where we see uh, frost on the roof sheeting in an attic. And what's the normal re, uh, knee-jerk reaction by the building community? Hope oh, we don't have enough attic ventilation. Hmm. Sometimes they'll go ahead and add some more ridge vent. They might add some pot vents. Sometimes they'll even put a power vent in. But think about it again. This is in the wintertime. We don't get frost in the summer. This is wintertime frost. If you are expecting to ventilate that warm, moist air, that got up to that sheeting in the first place. With ventilation, you're expecting the outside air to have some sort of energy available to pick up that moisture and airflow available to take it out of the attic. That's simply not the case. You could have all the venting in the world, but when it's 20 below zero at night, no sun, there's no air movement through the attic, but you've got holes in the ceiling of the house around can lights, electrical penetrations, bathroom fan housings. That warm, moist air is going up by stack effect, by air leakage, slamming into the roof sheeting that's at whatever the outside air temperature is at 20 below zero. It'll probably be 20 below zero. Remember, all the thermal insulation we put in the attic 
retards the energy from the home, which is the intent of the attic insulation, from ever getting to the roof sheeting. So it's similar to the wall. It's similar to the pop can. If we don't want the moisture to condense on any one of those three surfaces, you keep the warm, moist air from ever getting to that, and that can only be done reliably with air sealing. But the, re the, the reaction normally is to a frost situation in an attic to add more ventilation. And actually, you can make the case worse. If you add more ventilation and the wind does blow, remember that moist moisture got there from air leakage from the home. It didn't get through the vapor retarder. It got around the vapor retarder. Now, if I actually added more airflow to the attic, I could actually now increase the amount of air leakage on the top of the home actually throwing more moisture up there. If you put a powered attic fan in there, you may depressurize the roof assembly or the attic assembly and depressurize the entire house to actually backdraft a B-vent water heater in the basement. And there's been many studies done to verify that. So this situation here cannot be taken care of reliably by ventilation because the roof sheeting is always going to be so cold way below the dew point temperature of what homeowners decide to carry, and the outside air temperature is beyond our control. This is what, this is what I mean here. If we take a look at my office uh, instrumentation, I'm showing the outside air temperature conditions in the winter. I sat up at night for you, by the way, to try and wait for the outside air temperature to show right zero degrees. I waited for about an hour, and it was hanging around 0 0.9, so I took a picture. And you can see the bottom numbers represent the interior conditions in my office that day at 70 to 73 degrees Fahrenheit, 26% relative humidity. But outside, it was 0 0.9 and 82% relative humidity. And just to put this in context here, I ask people, okay, which one of these airs, which one of these bodies of air have actually more moisture in the air? Actual moisture. And most of the time, people say, well, Joe, that's easy. That's the one with 82%. I mean, the other one has got hardly any moisture in it. It's 26 degrees Fahrenheit. But even just to better help you understand the term relative humidity, when we see relative humidity on an instrument somewhere, it's simply telling us how full the air is related to its capacity to hold moisture at a given temperature. That's why when people talk relative humidity, they better tell you right away at the same time what the temperature is. 80% relative humidity at zero, there isn't any moisture in that air. Very little. 80% relative humidity when it's 70 degrees, that's like Florida. And this is why it's very difficult for homeowners to understand this when we ask them to ventilate their homes in the wintertime to now knock down the actual moisture content in their home to try and minimize the window condensation. If they can't do anything about increasing the surface temperature, we may now have to actually reduce the amount. They're looking at their hygrometer in the home, and it says, well, I hope it's not saying 73 degrees at night, but they're looking at it in this situation saying 73 degrees and 26% relative humidity. They think that's really dry compared to the outside air that's zero degrees Fahrenheit and 82% because they have no concept of what this means. Again, you could go to a psychometric chart or a psychometric wheel and look at this. So if I look at how much moisture is actually in the air at, 70 to, at 73 degrees Fahrenheit and 26%, I'll just set my wheel at 73 degrees Fahrenheit and line it up with the number on the outer wheel at 26%. And it'll tell me immediately how much moisture I have in the air. So I've got 73 degrees Fahrenheit, 26%. I've only got 32, well, I've got 32 grains of water in that inside air. 32 grains, and that's how we actually quantify the actual moisture content in a body of air. There's 32. Now, if I take the outside air at zero, my wheel doesn't even go that low. Let's just play make-believe for a second and say we're down at 20 degrees Fahrenheit and I line it up at 82% relative humidity. There's only 13 grains of actual moisture content in that outside air. I got 32 grains of actual moisture in the inside air, but it's being represented as being 26% of the total capacity of that interior air 
at 73 degrees. Remember, as we were always told in science class, that the warmer the air is, the more moisture it can hold, right? That's exactly what we're representing with the terminology of relative humidity. But homeowners will tell me, hey, I don't want to turn the ventilation on. I'm going to throw out all that energy in the wintertime, and I can't dry the inside down by bringing in air at 82% relative humidity. Again, you could use a psychometric chart or a wheel to show them that the actual moisture content is massively different here in the opposite direction of what they would think. So if we could throw out air that has 32 grains of actual water vapor in it, bring in outside air that only has 12, we're going to get a pretty good dry down. But they don't understand this at this time. Now what's also interesting, just to play a little spin here again on relative humidity, if I bring in that outside air at 20 degrees Fahrenheit and 82% relative humidity, and if I simply bring it in and warm that air up now to 70 degrees, the relative humidity is down to 11% from 82 to 11 because it's a function of temperature. The same 12 grains of water in the outside air that relate to 82% of the capacity of air at zero is now only 11% of the capacity of a cubic foot of air at 70. We have to get a handle on this, especially to help homeowners realize that they can ventilate even though the relative humidity outside is very high in the wintertime. Now again, here on this building with the OSB wall sheeting, you can see on here that the OSB sheeting was big time buckled. They took the siding off, they replaced the actual OSB twice now before we went to take a look at it and they kept asking me, well, what's the problem? I said, well, obviously there's enough interior moist air getting to the OSB sheeting, condensing on the surface, being absorbed by the OSB, the sheets push each other on the end and they simply buckle out. And they kept arguing about, well, I got a vapor retarder, I got a vapor retarder. I said, well, it's not about vapor retarders, it's about the slide we looked at earlier. It's about all the places they didn't air seal. So this is typically what this home had. It's not uncommon to what we build today, right? In new construction, we're going to frame the exterior walls. Somebody wants a bathtub, a shower stall, or a hot tub in a corner, a whirlpool, whatever you want to call it. They'll go ahead and build that platform, as you see framed here. They will insulate it normally, right? And they're going to put their typical vapor retarder on there. All right, what does that mean? Well, they did a great job of going after that one-third of a quart that we talked about earlier. So they got it covered on the one-third of a quart of water vapor that would go through the material in vapor form. But in this case, underneath the tub enclosure, where there is not going to be any sheetrock compared to above the tub enclosure, the edges of the vapor retarder material are not air sealed. So they have a great vapor retarder, but no air barrier. And again, the moisture that's going to get into that wall assembly is not going to get there by going through that plastic down below here. It's going to simply go around the unsealed edges of the polyethylene because they only provided vapor diffusion protection, no vapor transport protection, which is the one that we have to go after. So on this particular home, when we figured out what was going on, the wall sheeting was only buckled only buckled and massively behind both tub enclosures on the outside wall. And if they would have looked at it a little closer, you know, in trying to figure it out rather than trying to point fingers, they could have realized if they'd asked the question, well, where is this buckling occurred, occurring uh, with respect to inside the building? And it was directly in line, absolutely in line with both tub enclosures. And looking at the pictures that they did have from the home during construction, it was typical to what I'm showing here. So it's the unsealed polyethylene covered up by the tub enclosure itself that was the problem, air transport. Now, if we look at wall temperature performance, again, oftentimes people will say, well, Joe, I can manipulate the wall temperature enough that I don't have to worry about all this dew point hocus pocus. And I often ask, them, well, let's take a look at the real issues and what we know for sure. Wall temperature performance, number one, it's not always controllable by the builder. There's going to always be variations in outside temperature. That's got the weatherman. Variations in inside temperature, that's the homeowner. 
and also variations in inside moisture content, which is absolutely up to the homeowner. As long as we live in the United States, most people don't want to be told what to do in their own home. So if for some reason they feel they have to carry 50% relative humidity in the wintertime at 70 degrees Fahrenheit, that's their prerogative. They will have window condensation, and there's a very good per, uh, potential for them of having moisture-related damage to the building if that building is not built airtight. And no matter how they operate their building, a builder, designer, architect could still be asked to come back and investigate or look at this building failure and with no control. So we have to understand what we can and can't control and rather than uh, try and provide the homeowner with instructions on when it's outside air temperature or this, you can't do this, it's very unlikely. So airtight construction practices, on the other hand, are manageable with predictable performance. Unlike all the previous conversations with folks that say, well, you know, all you folks in the energy business promoting all this airtight construction are causing these building failures, that's not an accurate statement and it's not even fair. But when I ask them in, in, in reverse, well, how do you build a home just leaky enough to dissipate all the moisture to the, so that the building materials wouldn't have a problem? There's no answer for that. It's just a lot of interesting bar talk, but it really, there is no perception that makes that a reality in building homes that are just tight enough. If you want permanent building durability, you must keep warm, moist air from ever seeing a cool enough surface in our climate and the only way that can be done reliably, and we know how to do this with massive success, airtight construction, managed ventilation, and away we go. So you always need to review your air sealing options that you have. Let's take a look at this situation where people often tell me, well, gee, uh, you know, I'm going to just put an inch of sheet foam, Joe, on the outside of my building, and I won't have any problems with wall condensation. Or I will spray an inch of foam inside the wall cavity and now I won't have any wall condensation issues. What I'm showing here is two different insulations uh, values. Obviously our typical R19 bat in a 2x6 wall. On the left side, on the right hand side we're showing an R21 bat and what the colored graph is showing or the colored chart is we're looking down at a wall assembly from the top as if we're staring through the top plate. In the center you can see the stud and we're representing the temperature directly at the stud and halfway to each stud on each side of that stud that we're showing. So halfway to the middle of the next cavity so that we can get a fair representation of just one stud represented by the distance halfway to the next stud on each side. Now what I'm showing on the left hand uh, slide is that with interior temperature at 70 degrees and outside air temperature of zero, providing we could get this R19 bat to work in there perfectly, right? If you look at the little number on the bottom, right at the inside of the outside sheeting, which is going to be in this case our OSB sheeting, it's 3.1 degrees Fahrenheit, pretty close to the outside air temperature, right? We didn't allow any energy to get out there because we insulated in front of it. You can also see that the drywall temperature in the middle of the stud cavity is 67 degrees. That's why you're not going to see condensation occurring on the face of the drywall. It's 67 degrees Fahrenheit. But the wall sheeting is looking at 3 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, look at the, le the right picture, the right slide, where we didn't change the construction practices at all. This customer actually wanted to pay for a little bit more energy savings, so they bought an R21 back from you for a little more energy savings. Well, if that actually retards more energy, that means the OSB sheeting is being put farther into the refrigerator. So, and you can see that represented here. Now our OSB sheeting temperature fell to 2.7 degrees, you know, less than a half a degree difference. But the concept is that if I put more thermal value in front of that sheeting exposed to the outside air temperature, and I keep retarding the energy from getting to that sheeting, that sheeting is going to get closer and closer and closer to the outside air temperature. So if I go ahead and put blown-in insulation in this wall or even more urethane without any air sealing, I could still be in a situation where I could have some condensation occurring. That's where some of the spray foams come into play. Let's take a look at another one. Occasionally folks will ask me, hey Joe, I'm doing that one inch of urethane spray foam 
It could be open cell foam as well, but they're doing roughly one inch of spray foam in a wall assembly, in a two by six wall assembly. And they are under the uh, perception that now, point blank, they will never have a condensation problem in that wall assembly. Uh, I would often ask them, how do, you, how do you figure that out? Let's take a look at it. Same concept again. Now you can see on the slide that I'm showing the OSB sheeting way to the left. Now you can see that I'm representing one inch of spray foam, in this case urethane, on the inside of that OSB sheeting, sprayed right directly to the OSB sheeting. So basically we've moved the surface, a solid surface now, closer towards the house. And we added thermal value to that surface. So we're giving them the full credit for the urethane thermal properties. So now instead of that sheeting being what we have before there, three degrees or two degrees, we now raise the first condensing surface, the solid surface at which condensation could occur in that wall assembly. We raise that surface to 21 degrees almost. It's still 67 degrees on the face of the drywall. We didn't change that. We didn't change the outside air temperature, and we didn't change the inside. We manipulated the surface. It raised. It was risen up. It was increased, obviously, by almost uh, 16 degrees Fahrenheit. But Getting back to the concept here, is a temperature of 21 degrees Fahrenheit a guarantee that you would never have moisture problems in that wall assembly? Well, again, you could go to your psychometric wheel or a psychometric chart using the same numbers you might have written down before. If I have 70 degrees Fahrenheit in the house and I have 35% relative humidity in that air, I have a dew point temperature of 40 degrees which means if that air again, right, at 70 and 35, comes in contact with any surface, 35 degrees, it's going to be, or 40 degrees, it's going to be liquid. Well, even with the increase in thermal value here to 20, I'm still way below the dew point temperature of that air at 40 degrees. This is why you must be able to calculate some of this to predict building durability. Now, I could also look at this situation right now if this was your favorite building practice, and I, I like this combination. I just want to make sure people are aware of the limitations. Now, if I like this concept, and I know that that temperature is 21 degrees when it's zero, and I want to design the building for zero, you could also calculate this for any outside air temperature you want. But let's just say we're going to design this building to be moisture resistant in a wall assembly when it's zero outside, and I like this combination, and I know it's 21 degrees on that surface. I now could use the wheel or a chart, set my dew point temperature at 21 degrees. The homeowner still tells me they like to run 70 degrees Fahrenheit, so I can go up to the wheel. Now, they would have to keep that house at 15%, 15% relative humidity at 70 degrees Fahrenheit and they would still have condensation on any surface that's 21 degrees. I hope you're getting the point here that you can only manipulate surface temperatures so much. Homeowners are not, in most likelihood, going to be willing to dry their home down to 15% just to make that wall assembly bulletproof. We can build it bulletproof by keeping a, the majority of that water vapor from ever getting into that assembly, no matter how cool the surfaces are, it's always going to be the straightest path to permanent long-term building durability. So keep that in mind. Do a good job. Here's what that uh, situation should look like. Again, and I have no personal issue with this combination. I'm just trying to make people aware of it. Yes, you're increasing the surface temperature, which is great. You're now reducing that dwell time during the heating season of which that wall surface would be cool enough to have moisture issues, but it's not a guarantee. They would typically spray some foam in the wall and then put a fiberglass bat over the top or maybe blow in some material. But just like the window directly above this open cavity that I'm showing here, the window has got no problem right now because there's no mini blind in front of it. The foam has no problem right now because there's nothing in front of it. So as long as I didn't drywall that building, I left that wall assembly wide open with the foam and the window wide open to the home, I'm probably not going to have that much condensation in there. 
But if I go ahead now and put that fiberglass bat or any other thermal value in front of that foam, it's doing the same thing as putting a window treatment on the window above. We're now retarding the energy now from ever getting to the foam. So that surface of the foam at zero is going to be 21 degrees. That's the issue with this whole concept. So air sealing, air sealing, air sealing is always the best thing we can do for new homes. Follow up with ventilation and take care of combustion safety. You're good to go. Here's a case where I had to go out and look at a building uh, that wasn't even completed yet where the homeowner was absolutely told and he was convinced that by adding uh, money in his budget to put an inch of foam in a wall cavity that that was this, this particular designer's way of permanently building this home to never have any moisture problems guaranteed in a wall assembly. Well, if you look closely, especially at my index finger, it's wet. And the only reason I was over there is because they were already having water run out the bottom of this wall assembly even before the building was done. It wasn't a problem with the foam. It wasn't a problem with the fiberglass. It was not a problem with the nice 6 mil vapor retarder they had there. But at this particular time, obviously during construction, the vapor retarder was not airtight on the edges, so they had no air sealing. So this was not a, a rigged picture. I just want to show you that if that concept was true, that adding that much thermal value in a wall assembly was a guaranteed slam dunk way to never have a wall moisture situation, then even without the unsealed edges here, I should not have had a problem. And if you look at it from a finished building perspective, we see this quite frequently as well. We're often called out to look at homes that have moisture problems. And what we're looking at here is a, a basement, obviously, with a knee wall, a four-foot concrete wall in the basement with the rest stick frame, typically as we do for egress window exposure. But what's happening here is the homeowner called the, the builder and said, hey, I'm going to wire in the wall cavities here, and I'm pulling the fiberglass out to run my wires, and there's frost in the wall. What's up with that? Well, right away, the builder calls the insulator. The insulator says, well, Dave, you know, you bought the nice high-density fiberglass. We put the 6 mil vapor retarder on it. Can't be our fault. We got the vapor retarder on it. Well, if you look at it real close, I mean, the, the, the insulation is actually frozen. There's frost up here. What is it telling us? It's telling us two things always. There's obviously moisture got to that surface, and that surface is not only cooling, uh, cool enough to condense the moisture out, but it's cool enough to freeze it so we know that it's very cold in that assembly. Now, they're not going to take the insulation back out. They want to know why this is like this. And it's what we've been talking about here all during this workshop, air sealing. There was no air sealing done. If we back up a minute and take a look at how buildings are usually delivered to the homeowner, a lot of times, if it's a spec home, they will only insulate those knee walls and put the polyethylene vapor retarder on. They hammer staple the poly, right? This is typical. I don't have a problem with it, but that's what we're doing. So we've got great vapor protection, but absolutely no moisture by air transport protection. And let's look at it even a little closer to show you what I mean. This is a real nice digital shot a close-up of those unsealed edges I was just talking about. Here's polyethylene typically installed, and I don't have a problem with it. It's just that we hammer staple it. Well, on the upper walls, or the knee wall that we showed that had drywall on it, by screwing or nailing the drywall on, it will pinch enough of these ripples in the polyethylene that we'll probably get a pretty good air seal. But to leave those unsealed edges like this, on that knee wall or behind a bathtub that we showed earlier. It doesn't matter how thick the polyethylene is. It could be a nuclear vapor retarder. It doesn't matter. The water vapor having more in the house than, it, than there's less outside, the house being warmer inside than it is outside, that water vapor is just pushing on the building, trying to find a way to get to the outside, and all of these unsealed edges are the path this happens all the time. It happens all the time. Under tubs, behind shower stalls, knee walls in a basement. So it's the air sealing again that we want to hammer on that has to be done. When you leave the poly like this, this is not good enough. What a lot of our builder partners do in a temporary situation like this on a knee wall in a basement or in a bathtub enclosure that's going to be permanent, to seal the edges without having to get dirty with a caulking gun or any tape, to have, not have to worry about how cold or warm it is, 
They'll actually cut OSB strips about an inch and a half wide, leftover OSB strips, inch and a half wide. So they look somewhat like a long yardstick. On these unsealed edges now, they will cut this OSB sheeting long enough to cover all of these unsealed edges of the poly and simply power staple or nail them on. Now they're getting the same benefit as if they had the full sheet of drywall on it by pinching and sealing those edges. And the wood is a great economical way to do this. It's permanent. There's usually lots of leftover OSB sh uh, sheeting on a job site. And you don't have to worry about the caulk gun failing, whether it's too cold, too warm, too hot. You don't have to purchase any additional material. If we look at a couple other building failures um, from moisture coming in contact with roof assemblies, uh, this gentleman has an unvented roof assembly on this uh, sort of two and a half story home. Um, the roof was sheeted about five years ago, uh, re-roofed, because the home was about 20 some years old. And I was called because the guy that re-roofed the building um, said, hey, the roof sheeting now just caved in and it's only five years old. I said, well, that, that can't be a regular situation. This is not typical air leakage transporting this water vapor that we've been discussing to this point. There had to be some other issues, so they had the roof tarp. They went down to take a look at it. And when I got on the roof, this was just beautiful. Because if you look at it, the roof sheeting here, this is not even OSB. This is plywood. I mean, the real wood that people still like occasionally. This plywood sheeting on here was replaced five years ago, new. So it only had five years of wetting. But it's an unvented roof assembly, right? It's a hot roof, as we'd call it. No ventilation air whatsoever. This cannot happen just by unsealed edges of polyethylene. This now, now I'm looking for something to be physically pushing a lot of air with its water vapor content into this unvented assembly of which that moisture is going to come in contact now directly with that cold roof sheeting. So what we look, what we were looking for here was any connection to the mechanical system because if we have a connection of any kind with the air hammer, we can now aggravate those unsealed edges, aggravate those one-inch holes around the outlets and switches. And people say, well, that's just not possible. But if you think about it in a typical home with forced air heating, if you're standing in the bathroom with forced air heating, there will be a toe kick register, right, usually below the uh, vanity or maybe somewhere else within the bathroom. But good building practices and codes prevent us from putting a return air duct in the bathroom itself. They do not want moisture and odors being returned to the air handler and then distributed throughout the home. So what can happen now is while you're taking a nice warm moist shower and the door is closed, the furnace happens to come on. You only have a supply register. So it's pushing this nice air in the room trying to satisfy the temperature needs. But without an actual ducted return and the door closed, the only return to the air handler is the door undercut itself, which is not very high in new homes nowadays. So what you can actually wind up with is those bathrooms can be pressurized. You can actually measure this pressure. We do it all the time. So now you might have these small holes that we think are sort of insignificant. Now they're not only significant, they're being magnified by the pressure in the room itself. We've got holes around can lights, switches, outlets. We got our bath fan housing in the ceiling that people don't caulk. Now we're pressurizing that heavy moist laden air that you're generating by taking a shower and you're blowing that right into the wall assembly, blowing it right into the attic. So in this case here, there's no way that typical air leakage could have done this much damage. So we were looking for an air handler connection. So, and we did find that by the way. Now in this particular home, we had a, a just condensation on the bottom of the floor assembly in this home. It's a low income home, which is a nice compact home, well built, but they actually had a, a crawl space and they insulated the floor of the crawl space because they were trying to improve the efficiency of upgrade. And what we had uh, in here now was even had condensation on the actual fiberglass insulation. I mean, it pretty much turned to some interesting stuff here. So it didn't matter. We had air conditioning going on upstairs, high level of moisture content in the crawl space due to backed up drain tile that were plugged. So the floor assembly and the wall assembly was being aggravated with moisture. The moisture migrated into the building in vapor form 
came in contact with the insulation because they were air conditioning upstairs and it sweat all over the floor system. Now, it looks pretty interesting. Some of the wood that was laying in the basement looked pretty creative. It almost looked like someone was doing actual artwork. But this was just Mother Nature combined with moisture and mold spores on wood. It looked just like an oak tree being painted. And what happened here was there was poor drainage. The water then sat around the foundation, whipped up through the wall assembly, as you can clearly see, evaporated into the building. It now had an excessive amount of actual moisture, but now even in a summertime condition, they were able to get surfaces cool enough compared to that high vapor content that we had condensation. We always have to remember you can't have condensation without a water vapor source and cool surface. And last but not least, we always have to remember to always review a house as a system. So if today's uh, workshop helped you understand the mechanisms of moisture, what limits and what control mechanisms we do have, don't forget, if you start air sealing for all the right reasons we discussed today, don't forget the house as a system. We cannot now provide adequate ventilation and forget about combustion safety. So if you do that, build them airtight, ventilate them right, make sure you have no combustion safety issues. We'll be putting your customers in our homes in very good position to last very long, provide great comfort currently and down the road, and do the best on the environment by not having to replace all the damaged wood later on. So with that, I'll leave you for today, and that's the end of today's session. Thank you. But in control, in summary, I want to mention one time that control airflow through and into building assemblies, control surface temperatures where possible, provide homeowner with adequate moisture control. That's got to be tested ventilation for spot and whole house, and always evaluate your building practices regularly. 